continuous function and weird argument is very differentiable uh, part, so we have to think about this one. Function is differentiable and have um, relative extreme, that means local minimum, local maximum at this point. Then what could happen at that point is derivative either not exist or derivative must be zero. That's the definition of a critical points, right? Therefore, if you're just assuming if it is differentiable function, it is equivalent to say the derivative at that point is zero. We looked at some examples. Here's a local maximum, here's a local minimum. Oh, that looks like a derivative zero and looks like derivative zero there. So that makes sense. But it's the opposite. We're not looking at this particular example. We're looking at the general situation. If it is a local maximum, local minimum, then we have to conclude f prime of c equals zero. Right? So it's the other way around. So here's the proof of this statement. Proof takes a weird shape. If we assume it's differentiable, then f prime of c is either 0 or not, right? And we assume, let's say f prime of c wasn't 0, some positive number. And then not knowing anything except just we have a theory, just theoretically, or logically we devel develop and conclude something that it's contradictory and then we can prove that okay we assume we, we suppose f prime of c was positive and then necessarily contradict something that we already know then you can go and conclude that that supposition is necessarily wrong things like that so it starts with like this suppose f prime of c that exists we assume that exists which I call as m is positive, not zero. And I will show you that not knowing anything about f, f of c and specifically, we can still theoretically deduce something from this information. That information is a little bit contradictory to whatever it's given in here. So here is the first part. We're going back to the very beginning of a derivative. We limit h approaches zero. All right. So here is h approaches f of What's in the numerator, remember? The very definition of a derivative? There is 1 over h. Remember that part? What's inside the parenthesis? f of c plus h minus f of c. This quantity is not equal to m, right? It's not equal to m. But it approaches m, right? Approaches m. Fair enough? So that's a statement. What we're going to do with that h is that we're going to choose actual sequence of uh, as h approaches 0. We're going to choose h being 1 over n. Remember 1 over n? It's a sequence where n is 1, n2, n3, things like that, right? If you do so, how is this um, 1 over n, what happened to 1 over n as n approaches infinity? That approaches small to zero, right? Especially if it approaches actually zero from the right. It remains positive, right? Okay, so we're going to replace instead of h, we're going to replace with the 1 over n. See what happens. Right, 1 over h, one, you know, reciprocal. Do you agree that it's actually just n if you take the reciprocal? And inside there we have f of c plus h. h is now 1 over n, correct? and minus f of c, that is not equal to m. This will be incorrect, right? This is not exactly m. It is very close to m, correct? So if I use equal symbol, I can use a little bit of, okay, this is not exactly equal, but there is some term that we have to adjust it to make it equal, right? So that's what this delta n is, is determined by this n value we we'll keep changing. Then what can you say about this delta n? It approaches zero, thank you. But it could be positive or negative. We don't have a control in that. Well, we have a control in 1 over n. We know specifically what it is, but we don't know anything about f. So we don't have a control on what happens to delta n. All we know is that delta n approaches zero, right? Okay. Next one is that this m plus delta n Delta n is sometimes positive, sometimes negative, we don't know. However, delta n is going to be very, very small, right? 
no matter what m is, doesn't matter how small that m is, magnitude of delta n will be eventually smaller than the magnitude of m, correct? Because m is not changing at all, and this guy is going to be arbitrarily small. So there's no chance, eventually, at the end of the day, that this will, this delta n will kill that one being a negative number. This is a positive number, plus or minus, very, very small number. It must be positive. For all large n. We don't know how large n should be, since we don't know any, anything specific about f of x. But, theory says eventually, as you keep plugging in, at the end of the day, m plus delta n will remain positive, because magnitude of m will be a lot bigger. There's no chance that delta n will, you know, cancel that m. Fair enough? Yeah. Then this positiveness will give you, okay, the left-hand side, m times f of c plus 1 over n, minus f of c, that left-hand side must be positive. That's the that's the same quantity, right? So here is, uh, we're going to get rid of n by dividing both sides of inequality by n, which is positive number, then inequality stays in the same direction, remember? Yeah. If you're dividing both sides by negative number, then it switches the direction. But if it's a positive number, we have f of c plus 1 over n, minus f of c is being positive. Correct? And if you um, rewrite it like this, f of c plus 1 over n is greater than f of c by adding f of c both side. Okay, so here I'm going to give you an interpretation of this statement. Here's x equals c, right? Where is c plus 1 over n? To the right or left? To the right. This is where c plus n is. And you know, as we increase n, c plus 1 over n is going to be very, very close to c, right? f of c value is right here. f of c f of c plus 1 over n is always a slightly greater than f of c. Right? Always greater than here. Doesn't matter how close it is, always strictly greater because of m being positive. So, right next to the c of x equal to c, there is a value always slightly higher. What conclusion do we have in here is the following. f of c is not something. What is that something? It's always higher, right next to C. Doesn't matter how close it is, you mean. It's not equal to C. It's not not less than C either, but it's a, it's a word. It's about something is higher and lower, right, in terms of extreme values. What, ca what can we conclude? F of C is not a Local. Mm -mm. Local maximum. Well, see, this is why. The, why is it not a local maximum? F of C right here. It's not a local maximum because this guy is even higher. How can you say this is local maximum if there's right next to you, there's always higher number? So we can conclude that F of C is never going to be a local maximum, right? Okay. But it could be local minimum, right? So you look at the other the other direction, h here, being what is the other the other side? We use negative one over n, right? Still, this approach is zero, correct? Negative one thousand and one million is a negative zero point zero. Still approaches zero. Then what happens is that one over h, right? Here's one over h is one over negative one over n, right? So that's f of c minus 1 over n instead of plus 1 over n. That's h value. Minus f of c is going to be equal to m plus delta n again. Whether it's negative 1 over n or positive 1 over n, m never changes. m is positive number we supposed. Therefore, this one does still remain positive. What kind of n values? For all large n value. As we go further down, then this will eventually overcome. m plus delta n will remain positive. Then, what happens is that, what is this one? Negative n? So take the reciprocal. Negative n, f of c minus 1 over n, minus f of c is positive number, right? Because <coughs> right hand side is still the same thing. Now you divide both sides by negative n, right? 
then what happened to this inequality? It flips. So is f of c minus 1 over n minus f of c is less than 0 this time, right? Less than 0 as you divide both sides by negative n. Correct? If you rearrange this one, f of c minus 1 over n is less than f of c. Let's look at the interpretation of this one. Here's x axis. Here's your c. Where's the c minus 1 over n? Right next to the left here, right? Correct? This is where c minus 1 over n is. Slightly smaller than c. f of c is somewhere here. And this one says f of c minus 1 over n is slightly smaller, right? There will be millions of zillions of trillions of points right next to c is always smaller than f of c. So what is the conclusion? f of c is not a local minimum because there's always lower point. How can you say it's the lowest point, right? So what's the conclusion? Going back, if we suppose something like that, we have two conclusions. f of c is neither local max or min, right? Max or min. That's our conclusion. Nor min. Does the conclusion make sense? If you suppose that f prime of c is a positive number, then you will be able to conclude it's not a local maximum, local minimum. There's always higher and lower point right, right next to each other. Okay? That's the end of this supposition. Let's go back and see why this is a problem. I want you to read this statement in here. Why is this conclusion is problematic? f of c is neither local max or min. You look, read this statement in here. Figure out something, something is not right. Yeah, it says relative extrema, right? f of c is a local maximum or local minimum. That's what's given. So if you conclude something like this, it's contradictory to the property we have. Right? So what went wrong? Something is contradicting and you go back and figure out this is actually what, what went wrong because of this. Is this supposition. We didn't know if it is zero or positive or negative, right? We suppose it's a positive, it ran into a contradictory conclusion. Now what is wrong? Our supposition is wrong f prime of c cannot be positive. That's our conclusion. If it's a positive, you run into a problem. So what are the two possibilities left? It's either zero or negative, right? You go through this argument, or let's say this one is less than zero, and you mimic this argument, you will conclude the same thing. Is, is neither local maximum or minimum. And then you go back, whatever we suppose is necessarily wrong. So what are you left with? That prime of c being zero. And that's why it's a zero. Going through the other side of the supposition, f prime of c being less than zero is a homework problem. Alright? Time's up.